Okay, so there are a few questions about linearization and how can you tell if you have an overestimate or an underestimate? So the red line here is the graph of a function. And if we wanted to do a linearization of the function, linearization makes it like look linear. So that's basically a tangent line. So if we draw a tangent line, the reason linearization works is if I zoom in enough, I can get to the point where the curve looks like a straight line. I'd have to zoom in a little bit more here because I can still see a difference between the curve and the tangent line. But if I zoom in enough, eventually I get to the point where I can't really tell a difference between the function and its tangent line. So the line looks linear. So that's the idea behind linearization, okay? So you zoom in enough and the, the tangent line becomes indistinguishable from the secant line. Or if X is close enough to your base point, in this case, the base point is one, if x is close enough to one, then I can't tell the difference between my tangent line and the function. And so if I need to evaluate the function, I might as well just evaluate it by using the tangent line instead of the function. So if x is close enough to a, then um, if x is close enough to a, then sine of x is close enough to the tangent line. So if I need to evaluate sine of x, sine of some number, I might as well plug that number into the tangent line instead of sine because it's really easy to plug into a tangent line. You only have multiplication and division or addition to worry about. Um, the refresher on how to get the equation of a tangent line is right here. You have your base point, which is a specific x value. You calculate the derivative and you plug that specific value into the derivative. This thing right here is the slope. This needs to be a number, not an expression with an X or a Y in it. It just needs to be a number. Then you have the letter X that stays as a letter, minus A, the A again is a number, and F of A is the output that's corresponding to your base point, again, a number. And all of this is equal to Y, okay? So that's a reminder on how you can get the tangent line. And the idea that is if X is close enough to A, you can't really tell the difference between the tangent line and the original function, so you might as well just use the tangent line. Now, we've got a question about, um, let me find the chat window if you have other questions. Let me know <clears throat> on this topic. And then the next question was, how do you know if you have an overestimate or an underestimate? So I'm going to move and look at different tangent lines. Okay, so I'm just changing that base point. It's making a new tangent line every step of the way. So right now, if I used a tangent line instead of the red function for a value close to negative two, would I be overestimating or underestimating? Type over or under in the chat window. Is the tangent line smaller than the function or bigger than the function? The actual values. The red line would be the actual value. The purple line would be the approximation. Okay, so that's an underestimate. How about now? Is that same? Type same if it's still an underestimate, type over it's an overestimate. So again, we're asking is the red function, the actual value bigger than or smaller than the purple function? So this should still be an underestimate because the red function is on top of the purple function. It's y values are bigger. But if I switch over to here, now the purple values are larger than the red values. So the tangent line is an overestimate. Okay, so if the tangent line is on top, then we're talking about an overestimate. If the tangent line is on bottom, then we're talking about an underestimate. What can we say about F? Like what characteristic of F kind of talks about when the tangent line is on top or bottom. Or just look at how the graph is shaped. And on the stretches where we have an underestimate versus an overestimate, what characteristic can you talk about F? Like what does F have that corresponds to the same intervals when the tangent line's on top versus when the tangent line's on bottom? So what's special about F? Yeah, we want to look at concavity, right? So if I have an underestimate, is my function concave up or concave down? Underestimate, the tangent line is under the curve. So is that function concave up or concave down? Yeah, so the function is concave up. And we could even talk about 
using tangent lines to help us figure out if the tangent lines are under the function, the function's concave up. If the tangent lines are over the function, then the function's concave down. So if the function's concave up, your tangent line approximation will be what? Overestimate or underestimate? If the function is concave up, your tangent lines are an underestimate or an overestimate. Good, underestimate. If the function's concave down, are the tangent lines an overestimate or an underestimate? So down corresponds to an overestimate. Okay, so you can either compute the exact value and compute the approximation, or you can look at the concavity and kind of predict whether you're going to have an overestimate or, or an underestimate. Um, so when the concave up and concave down meet, or when a function switches from concave up to concave down, what's going on there with the over underestimates? That's a great question. Where the concavity changes would be like right about there. On one side, the tangent line would be an underestimate. So like look at negative one, we have an underestimate. But on the other side, look when x is equal to positive one, we have an overestimate. So the concavity changes at zero here. And on one side, the tangent line is underneath. On the other side, the tangent line is above. And that's actually called a point of inflection or an inflection point. We'll be talking about that next week. Um, taking a look at slide eight. What we're playing with is getting two base points, creating a secant line, and then is there another place where the tangent slope is equal to the secant slope? So that's kind of what we're playing with here. And if your function is continuous, it looks like you should be able to do this. If your function is got a sharp point, though, it doesn't really work so well. So a lot of people said here, this is impossible to take our black line and make it have the same slope as the secant line. We've got this sharp cusp going on here. Okay. And here's a function where the, um, this one's really hard to read right now. I wonder if I can. Okay, so we've got going on, I'll just move this out of the way. This is a discontinuous function, the purple parts. Um, so the function jumps. So you've got the slope and then just when you think you might be getting close, the function changes. So we're having a really hard time getting that purple or getting the black dot to match up with the, uh, getting the black line to match the slope to the secant line, okay? So this function has no sharp corners, but it has some jumps in it, some breaks and discontinuities. Okay, so the points need to be defined. So the function needs to be defined. Um, we need continuity and we need differentiability. Okay, so differentiable and continuous. Those are the two big keys for the mean value theorem. So that's what we've got going on here. Okay, so anytime you have a function that is continuous on a closed interval and differentiable on an open interval, you are guaranteed, it's inevitable, there's no way around it, you are going to have, a, you can make a secant slope and then you're gonna be able to find a place where you can uh, draw a tangent slope and have that tangent slope be the same as the secant slope. So the hypothesis is the if bits. So continuous on a closed interval and differentiable on the interior. So get the endpoints correct, okay? Because they actually do matter. So differentiable on the open interval means we don't care about the differentiability of the endpoints. But the continuity on a closed interval, we do care about the continuity of the endpoints. Okay, so if you have that, then you're guaranteed to find at least one place where the tangent line has the same slope as the secant line. So here's another way to, to, to kind of parse it out. So the if bits are very nicely positioned. Yeah, the interior is between the two points. So the interior is the same thing as an open interval. Interior is the same thing as open interval. Closed interval is like part one here. There's the closed brackets. Open interval is the A, B with the parentheses. The open, open interval means we don't include the endpoints. Okay, and a couple of ways to see this. The F of B minus F of A over B minus A. We should be getting good at thinking about that as slope. So slope of a secant line. Or we could think about that as average rate of change. And F prime of C is instantaneous rate of change, which is the same thing as the slope of a tangent line. Okay, 
So again, this is a closed interval and this is an open interval. So the conclusion says it is inevitable that you will be able to find a C value where the tangent slope is exactly equal to the secant slope. Okay, so hopefully you got to play around with this and the MVT rubber band thing where you change the function to make it work. Okay, so if you're using the mean value theorem, MVT mean value theorem, you need to check the hypothesis pieces. So do we have continuity on the closed interval? Well, this is a parabola, so yes, we kind of get that for free. The differentiability, again, it's a parabola, we get that for free as well. Okay, so that means we've satisfied the hypothesis and we can dig into the conclusion. So if we need to find f of b minus f of a all over b minus a, right? That's just y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. That's just the slope formula. We would do, um, let's see, b is going to be 1, a is going to be 0. So if we plug 1 in, we're going to get 1 squared, which is 1 plus 2 minus 1. So that's going to be a 2. So f of 1 is equal to 2. So we can do 2 minus, if you plug in a 0, what do we get? Let me know in the chat window. What is f of 0? So we are on slide 16, or if you're on Zoom, you'll know what slide we're on. So if you're not watching Zoom, you're on Desmos, get to slide 16. Yeah, f of 0 is negative 1. And then we do 1 minus 0. So we get 2 plus 1, we get what, 3 for the slope? Is that what people were getting here? We have some negative 2s. We have some 3s. Ooh, it's a, right, it's a race. Who's going to win, 3 or negative 2? Oh, we have another three there, got some threes. Yeah, so the people who wrote negative two, what do you think happened? I don't know if I'm seeing that off the top of my head. Okay, but hopefully you, you agree with the, the mathematics now and you can figure that out. Okay, so now what we wanna do is we wanna set three equal to F prime of whatever the base point is. So what is the base point here? The base point, we don't know. That's exactly what we're trying to find, right? F prime of C is gonna be equal to three. So first of all, let's compute F prime of X. So let me know in the chat window, what's the derivative of X? I guess you're all ahead of me, huh? In the chat window, what is f prime of x? Yeah, using the power rule, we just get 2x plus 2. So we say, when does 3 equal 2x plus 2? And so if we subtract 2 from both sides, we get 1 equals 2x. And so you get x equals 1 half. Is that how we did? Some people are working on it. Okay, but that's what we mean by this part of the question is we take the derivative. And I guess to be consistent, I really should have put a C here. I get mad at you all for notation all the time. I should make sure that I hold myself to the same standards. Questions on the slide a Q or give me a Y if you're ready to move on. Oh my goodness, I lied. It is 2.50. So you can go ahead and take off. The exit slip, this is the piece you need to do to get the participation points. I won't grade it before Friday morning at 6 a.m. So you're gonna have to think hard about these. Okay, and the, the trick is think about all of the pieces of hypothesis and what piece can you break to kind of satisfy these conditions. All right, so an idea behind implicit differentiation is based off the chain rule. Say that y is some function of x, but you don't know anything else. You don't have any more details. 
So if you're going to take the derivative of some function of y, say like cosine of y, well, you can take the derivative of cosine, which is negative sine. And remember the chain rule tells you that the derivative of f of g, in fact, I'm going to be do my lazy thing here. The derivative of f of stuff is equal to the derivative of the outside function, so f prime, plug in stuff, multiply by the derivative of the stuff that was on the inside. So multiply by stuff prime. So here we're going to do uh, minus sine of stuff times stuff prime. Well, what is stuff? So in this case, stuff was equal to y. Okay, and then what is the derivative of y with respect to x? Okay, so we basically can't really figure out what the derivative is, so we literally write the derivative of y with respect to x. And that's basically the best we can do. So if you have the derivative of e to the y, that's the same thing as doing the derivative of e to the stuff. And e is the only e to the x is the only function that is its own derivative. And then you have to multiply by stuff prime if you need to do the chain rule. So we have e to the stuff, which is e to the y, and then you multiply by stuff prime. And since stuff is y, you are literally multiplying by the derivative of y with respect to x. So I literally write down the derivative of y with respect to x. Um, OK, so Samantha, you wanted x e to the y. And in this case, we have a product with implicit. So um, we're going to have f and g. So we do f prime g plus f g prime. So f prime, the derivative of x is 1, copy down g, copy down f, and now we multiply by g prime. Mm -hmm. And we just figured out the g prime above, so it's e to the y dy dx. And then you could, if you had an equation, if that was equal to something else, you could go ahead and solve for dy dx. Okay. 